Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Daria from Source Korean. And today we have a great guest, Jana from YLT Translation. And uh, it's uh, been really pleasure to to have conversation with you last webinar and, you know, like the couple of uh, different meetings and excited to uh, have a discussion with you today. Hi, Daria. Thank you so much for having um, me again. Always a pleasure to be on your podcast. Okay, great. Uh, so then let's start with the uh, like first question I wanted to ask you. Uh, so uh, I know that you're running list optimization, translation, and localization agency. And what I can see here right now, it like there are a lot of new markets which Amazon uh, kind of focus on. They can see uh, interesting uh, movements in the Middle East because we like focus on mid the Middle East. We can see uh, that uh, company actually thriving in India. The, a, a lot of happening uh, in Europe still because it's uh, quite a big market. Uh, we can see there's uh, Australia, also Mexico, and like lot of lot, lot of different part of the world uh, which Amazon are active in. So in one of various global markets, which you think from your experience and from your uh, like clients experience, which, uh, which one appears the most promising for the Amazon sellers? So yes, so uh, definitely uh, Amazon has been pushing sellers into expanding more and more. And that is definitely because they've uh, activated more marketplaces and you're absolutely right. Um, there are there is a lot of like lot happening on the global level. Um, Europe being a great continent to sell on uh, itself has a couple of new marketplaces like Sweden and Poland. Uh, now, last year, we haven't seen any particular increase in sales of those marketplaces. But I would say that this year that they've been thriving more than last year. Um, I, I'm expecting great things from Poland and Sweden. Generally, like as marketplaces, especially maybe Poland, that's probably like my uh, topic because of the all like um online um online shops. I mean, they have about twelve thousand online shops. Um, their marketplace Allegro is uh one of the top top ten marketplaces in the world. It comes right after Tmall and Shopee. There are so many amazing things um that have great potential in Europe. So I would definitely focus on Poland next year. Uh, I think that that would be uh, probably a really interesting marketplace. Really curious to see how it evolves further, but also it depends on how much Amazon pushes that marketplace as well. Because what happened like with the, the Dutch marketplace, uh, when it landed on Amazon map, uh, they didn't particularly do anything in the first year. Like they didn't even roll out PPC for that uh, specific marketplace. And then Bull being a local marketplace that was dominant in that country, um, they were still number one and everybody would go to ball. But then um, last year, Amazon decided to just, you know, um, attack the ball and like the Dutch uh, 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 e-commerce like in full force. And there are now dominant uh, marketplace um, to sell on in the Netherlands. So I would say that apart from Amazon, like ball is also very interesting to sell on in the Netherlands as also as um, Allegro. Like, I think it's very, very interesting. And what is really good is that once you set up all the Amazon listings, um, if you want to sell on Allegro or Bold, it's going to only be like a fragment of those listings that you made uh, that will, that should be something that you need from content for Allegro or Bold because all of the other marketplaces are much more simple when it comes to content you need to provide them with. The algorithm is not that complex or sophisticated or anything like that. So I would say that, you know, if you sell on Amazon in those countries, you should look for like other local uh, marketplaces to sell on as well. Um, once you have the, the translations, all the keywords and everything uh, done in place. Uh, you mentioned India. India is definitely a really, really big and interesting marketplace. A lot of Indian sellers, a lot of Indian brands are there. Um, we don't tackle a lot with India because mostly we work with U.S. Uh, based brands and, and, you know, the U.K. Brands, let's say 30% of German brands, and they also want to go like expand elsewhere. But we haven't seen anyone decide to sell in India because the competition is pretty fierce in India. You cannot beat the, um, let's say, like uh, uh, whoever's running their PPC, like the workforce, all of that. You can't beat them because they are very, um, I would say, I would even say like um, competitive in pricing. I would say that they're like, you cannot compete with pricing, like they're offering what they're doing. 
um, and they're very capable. They are very like they're fast learners. So um, I think that India is like very much saturated with Indian sellers. Um, but also like we have UAE being very interesting, especially for like U.S. brands who expand, who don't need a lot of translations. If you want to target expats, for instance, like who want to furnish their apartments, home decor is still a good category to sell on uh, in uh, UAE. And of course, like the up and coming um, Amazon marketplaces, they've been um, preparing our South uh, Africa in Nigeria. I think that will definitely be like something very, very interesting. I think it's going to roll out next year. Uh, I think I, I posted about it last year, how this was like in the works. Um, so that is going to be really interesting to see how that goes, uh, because that will be the first time that um, Amazon will be available on the whole continent. In Nigeria and South Africa are very, very interesting marketplaces. And uh, you would need English for those. So that will be really, really, I will be really, really curious because um, you have like really big population that doesn't have a lot of options like the rest of the world does. So that will be really interesting to see where that goes. Yeah, wow, it's uh, really interesting because what we see here, we also expand into Southeast, uh, South Africa, uh, mm -hmm. like this year. So yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's something what we're really uh, looking forward to. Um, okay, but yeah. Uh, let's say, for example, if you're local US seller and you build up your company in the US and you now like thinking, oh, should I actually uh, more focus go deeper in, in, in the market or should make decision to prioritize and go for like basically to go to uh, emerging markets? Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Like uh, how people uh, sh sh should look at this decision and uh, mm -hmm. how difficult it to localize the product uh, and everything uh, according to the local markets? Yeah, so um, a lot of brands ask that same question, like, when should I expand? Like, what should my, be my strategy? So my, my, my two cents on that would be that if you're a U.S. brand and then you've just started out, you have like one product, maybe a couple of variations, and you haven't really figured out the whole game and like the strategy, I think you should focus on your whole marketplace first and then maximize on whatever you can do on that marketplace. And then maybe if you're like, you know, if things go well, then you're like, you know, you're a successful brand and successful seller in the US. Then you might think of like expanding elsewhere once you have the budget, the profits, all of that. And of course, the most important thing is after you've done due diligence, because um, expanding globally or to other marketplaces is not for everyone. Not everyone should do it at all cost, because what works for your competitor uh, might work because they've done their due diligence, their numbers are great, but it might not work for you. So you really have to like do your homework and understand what are the pain points, what are like some advantages, like how you can be your competitors. Uh, what about the pricing, the VAT? Like you have to like get all costs together and then understand like if this is going to be something worth doing for your brand or not. Um, and I, I I would say that I I don't think U.S. market is saturated. I would just say that it, it is very, very hard and complicated to sell in the U.S. market if you're starting off right now as a seller than, let's say, like three years ago. But I still think that you can definitely do, you know, like do well on a, on a U.S. marketplace, especially if you know how to run your PPC and if you have like great content and images. I think that is uh, crucial storytelling, all of that. So definitely like I would focus on your home marketplace, whatever that is. Uh, first and then see if um, it works well for you then great then you should like think about maybe expanding elsewhere or if you maybe tried everything in the U.S. you were doing fine but then you hit the wall because there is nothing more you could do but you've understood I, I, but you've understood how it all works and you have what it takes to go elsewhere because a lot of times we have brands that are making an equal amount of revenue in Europe as they are making in the US and they are a very successful US brand. So there is a lot to uh, to think about. But as I said, uh, don't think if you, uh, that, that you should just expand just because you've heard like this or that, like is doing it, like this brand is doing it, you know, because um, not a lot of products will be as successful as they are in your home marketplace. Like for instance, like I need to um, mention also Amazon Japan, that is probably like one of the best marketplaces to sell on because you don't have a lot of competitors. Like PPC clicks are literally like 
for free and everything is just like so easy because people are afraid of this language barrier keywords all of that they're like they don't know how to handle it but it comes with a very big but uh, uh, this Japanese marketplace because you need to have a specific market which is going to be for that specific marketplace because don't think that you have a bestseller in, in Europe or US don't think it's going to be bestseller also in Japan because it usually will not um, Japanese marketplace is very specific but if you have a really good product for it um, you're definitely going to be successful so this is something to, to think about and I think the best way how to um to understand like if you're going to be successful or not is to talk to like Japanese audience, like find some Facebook expat groups and just like try to kind of uh, dwell into like that culture and like see if there's something that they would like. Usually those are some more unusual products that they would like, but we've had sellers that had like tremendous success um, in selling those products over there. Got it. That's actually very interesting. They can kind of see the similar situation to their uh, if they're uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, mm -hmm. because sellers they don't want to uh, create listings in Arabic, and they don't want to you know like go through all of this you know uh, hustle and uh, like. Uh, but th basically, there is like growing so fast. The numbers are so good, and it's not saturated as it is. As, and as you said, their PPC is uh, really, really low out there. Um, yeah, that's the that's very true. Uh, but uh, like I guess in twenty twenty three, their SEO becomes very, uh, very interesting topic because I guess mm -hmm. it's not working as it used to work before. For example, like. Five years ago, <laughs> let's say, then you optimize your listing and you get in like a lot of uh, traffic, uh, like uh, for free. I, I may be wrong. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and um, basically, uh, what do you think of the SEO of the listing optimization now? Uh, what purpose it works for? And uh, how to set apart uh, yourself uh, against your competitors uh, using like different techniques. Yeah, so when it comes to like foreign languages, like not English, it's really easy because a lot of times these brands, they do not pay any attention to how it, how anything sounds like in, in the, the, uh, the foreign language because they don't speak it and their team doesn't speak it and they don't really understand uh, the importance of it. So they understand the importance of it on their home marketplace, but they don't understand the importance of it on another marketplace because it's in another language they don't understand, which to me is still like a very big conundrum because I'm like, if the content matters to you in one language, why doesn't it matter to you in another language? So, you know, but when it comes to, let's say, English, when it comes to your home marketplace, I think SEO is really important. And I think now more than ever, like having really good keywords is something that is going to help you, um, you know, pop up in more search results and like get better, um, in, like more impressions, more uh, click through rates, all of that. Um, what I think it's the most relevant thing when it comes to listings are images because this is what you see first and keywords because without keywords there will be no visibility of your product um, so I think content storytelling all of that is important but this comes second before keywords um, sorry after keywords because keywords are crucial for the product to understand um, to, 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 for the audience to understand that um, you are relevant for like specific search terms um, I would say that, for instance, like in the U.S., what is really important is to maximize on, let's say, Spanish keywords and backends because of the Hispanic population. But what we've seen is that it also works with other countries. For instance, like in Germany, you have a very big Turkish population. Then they would also search for some um, keywords in Turkish. And then you will probably think like this is like a mambo jumbo. Like, what is this word? But a lot of times this word is going to be something that is written in a different language. And none of the competitors, like from our experience, none of the competitors are using that in their backends. So probably you will be the only one who's going to be ranked for that. Um, even if it's like two, three thousand search volume, it is two, three thousand potential sales because of people um, searching for the product in, in that language. So we've seen that something like that works. But uh, definitely like you, you should um, not rely only like on one tool. Like you should definitely do like go in your brand analytics see all the search terms, queries, all of that, 
uh, there are like a bunch of um, tools that you can use to do like a really good extent um, keyword research. But what is more important than just search volume is the relevancy, because a lot of times like the relevancy would show you like how important this keyword is. And a lot of times also what we do is like, if you do the keyword research and you have like the search volume, you have the relevancy, uh, then a lot of times, because people in speaking about like other languages, people would not understand what this keyword means. And then it would say that relevancy is zero, but actually this keyword makes a lot of sense. And then you would be the only one using that keyword in the title and all of that. So I would say that when expanding to another marketplaces, uh, content in different languages is not that difficult to, let's say, like rank for like really well or really high. And I do like a bunch of analysis on my LinkedIn profile where I analyze like top selling categories, let's say in Germany, like wet brush. And then like I did analysis like content top 10, like competitors or 15, don't remember. But um, I found only like four that were doing a great job. And I'm talking about like the best selling product on whole Amazon Germany. So you can just like imagine like what are the other categories that where you can like be in like top five competitors when it comes to content. Um, and, and you can just beat them by using like really good keywords and content that connects with the audience because a lot of brands really miss out, out, miss out on that because they try to fix like PPC, this and that. But six months after you launch your product, you see drop in sales. And that is most likely going to be because your content doesn't make a lot of sense. A lot of people use Google Translate. A lot of people use AI. It's still not good enough. It just still doesn't localize. None of these tools use keywords. They don't have login to all of these like uh, research tools that all of us use. So for now, it's still not great. And I would advise against using any of the machine or AI related uh, tools to create your listings. <laughs> so um I, I i can see i can see your point uh i totally agree with that uh although we have the part of the, you know like ai then ai generate yeah. listings and uh what we can see the basically usually sellers uh there are two types of sellers one is who's like doing multiple li listings like hundreds of listings and of course for them it's like big help and even the ones who like basically uh just j just like playing the, the list and they're trying to see what their better version of the list and what the better version of the yeah that's that that's that's okay but what i was referring to is that if you want to create like a plus content like you know a plus plus premium whatever you want to like convey the same message you have from one language to another then it doesn't do a great job what i think where ai does a great job is creating something out of nothing so when it comes to copywriting and writing something just like based off of like the prompt or like just like small information then i think the ai tools like do a great job with this but when talking solely about translations like from one language <laughs> to another is still just not good enough. And also because a lot of times these AI tools, they just take certain portion of text, they translate what, what they think it's relevant, and then they recreate the rest of the content in another language, which is not good because then you would not have all the information that are very relevant for you in from the source text taken into another language. So you will miss out on like a lot of um, information. That's why I think the AI tools are still not great for the translations because they do not focus on like, copy pasting and adjusting the source text that they have but what they are great at is creating new content uh out of absolutely nothing and that is why ai tools are amazing and you can use a lot of those for like listings and blogs and like your tool is amazing with that but when it comes to translations it's still not at that level i'm sure it's going to get there at one point i just don't think it's top priority for them to adjust like ai tools to do a better job with translations. That's just my my thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, and uh, of course it's it, it it depends, you know, like how you work with AI and you know, like what kind of uh, data you give to AI and basically exactly. the kind of 
yeah, it's it's not focused on this specific, uh, thing. You're you're kind of hundred percent right. Um, and when we talk about their uh like packaging, like there's a lot mm -hmm. of sellers they asking like which countries uh, require you know like have some specific requirements of packaging for their uh Amazon and which are not and how to approach uh this this issue uh like product packaging localization. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, first of all, like Amazon has been pushing the simple rule that, that is, if you're going to ship to a certain country, your label has to be translated to that language. A lot of brands don't know like what parts of like packaging need to be translated. Basically, it's only like the back of the, of the packaging with all the labels on it, ingredients, all of that. It's probably going to be like about um, anywhere between like 70 to 150 words, so not much. So it's not a big of an investment uh, financially, but in order to ship to all of these countries, you need to have all of these labels translated to these languages. Otherwise, they would not pass customs. They would not enter the country. So what a lot of sellers do is like they have all these like peel and seal labels in the back translated, let's say they sell in Europe to all these six, seven languages and they're good to go. Um, usually like um, depending on the product category, uh, you do have like some certain regulations when it comes to supplements, it's more or less difficult. I mean, they're just like a bunch of regulations that kind of are the same as like what you can use or not use in your product listings. Like you cannot use, for instance, words like weight loss or loss, or in Europe, you can't use words like dietary supplements and stuff like that. So we're well aware with like, just like general rules of like what you can or like cannot apply uh, to like translate another language. But a lot of times like we, um, uh, we rely on the sellers to just basically uh, deliver uh, the, those information to you, you know? So basically, uh, to us, so basically we cannot rely on them to do like the whole the legal uh, product compliance research and then give it all to us. But we are well aware like of the information that uh, we can't put on uh, the, the labels or have like some false or suspicious medical claims that something helps with this or will make your rash go away. But like playing with words and using terms like uh, that will, uh, for instance, uh, make this thing easier or might um, might help you um, feel more comfortable, not better, or help you cure a certain disease. So this is something that is very always very tricky to to handle when it comes to supplements. Of course, a lot of people have supplements because it's basically. Um, um, this is uh, what uh, brings the most money. So a lot of people want to be in supplements, but uh, there are like a, like different guidelines for those. And you know, like whoever wants to um, you know uh, get some more information, happy to share the list that we use because we have like a full on vocabulary. They're like constantly updating uh, for our languages. So I'm I'm happy to share that if any of their um, audience is interested in that and if, you know if it can be helpful to anyone so. wow that's cool it's uh it's really would be great uh so guys comment below to get the list um and um uh like uh from the customer perspective when seller looking for the agency who gonna do like uh, the work with their uh like localization of content and translation uh what do you think is the main criteria in and, and what helps your self to like maintain the quality of the translation and ensure it's like it's works really good yeah well first of all like we have a very big team and then on that team we have a lot of proofreaders as well and our whole team has been with us for at least three years we've been five years around so we do about two thousand products every month so we have a like a really like a lot of quantity uh, that we go through. We see a lot of things. A lot of times we get like uh, updates from clients so that we learn new things that way. Uh, a lot of things clients have no idea why the product got banned or this or that. So like, they're constantly like new information. And sometimes Amazon lets something fly and other times it's like, no, this is not great. You know, um, a lot of people have grandfathered listings, so they think they can get away with certain things they have to look in their listings and, and so on. So um, whenever we get like content and listings and everything that we do, basically everything is first done by um, translators that understand Amazon. They have all the 
knowledge. They know all the rules, limits, all that forbidden words. And then um, they do keyword research and then it all goes to uh, first set of proofreaders. The proofreader makes sure everything is uh, the right place, the uh, keywords, the guidelines that brand gave us. And then if something was wrong, then it was sent back to translators and they fix it. And then it was sent to another set of proofreaders because if you have two different set of eyes that say it's okay, then basically that's going to be fine. Um, someone can prefer this or that style, but when it comes to content, if you have like green lights from two different teams, then de definitely it's, it's, it's going to be fine. And then it's sent over to our project managers to double check everything again, like the, the keywords and everything that um, the brand filled out in the questionnaire that they want us to, to, to focus on because we do send our onboarding questionnaires to clients um, because it's really important for us to be on the same page with the brand. Sometimes they prefer a more informal or formal approach or um, they do not want some certain keywords to be used or they prefer some other things that we have, you know, we are absolutely not capable of knowing without them telling us. So this is what we focus on. And then after that, it sends it to the client. And usually like, you know, um, we do not do a lot of revisions because we really pay attention to high quality and um, this is what we've known for. And, you know, we don't do a lot of advertising or anything like that. It's basically word of mouth. And this is what I'm really proud of. And so we would not do anything to jeopardize that um, reputation that we've uh, gained in the space. Wow, that's uh, really, really impressive. I think uh, it's very rare that you have that kind of uh, quality, you know, uh, control in the agency because I guess a lot of agencies, they, what they do, they just, you know, like outsource, outsource, outsource everything. And, uh, yeah. yeah it's well, we are, uh, we are an agency that a lot of other agencies also work with because of the problem that, you know, they don't want to outsource to like a random freelancer or someone who's going to do like a project-based, you know, business and stuff like that. Everyone that's like on our team, they are uh, contractors, but they're dedicated to us. So they're like part of a team. They do not just like come and go and we hire like new people for a project, but everybody's like a part of the team. We do like team buildings and all of that. We're a fully remote company, but we're going to try to make people feel like they belong somewhere, like they belong to our YLT team. So it was very important for us to kind of have all these procedures in place because of big number of people that we work with. Um, and I think we've uh, we've managed to uh, to do so. Of course, I mean, every now and then, like, you know, we're all humans, human factors. There are mistakes that happen, but we really try to kind of prevent, um, prevent that from happening too often. Wow, uh, that's really impressive. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jana, for for their interview. Um, this was a really interesting uh, discussion. And uh, thank you guys for watching and uh, have a great sales.